Welcome to The Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And with Mike. As we read through our favourite series of novels, you know the ones we mean, the Aubrey Matry novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, we're getting stuck into our new novel here. Help us remember where we got to last week. Help us anticipate, Mike, where we might be coming to this week. Oh, thanks, Ian. Well, last week in Chapter 3, the crew had headed to Batavia on Lipo's junk. They had avoided one pirate attack, but then were stopped by Wanda's larger pirate proa. Wanda told Stephen that the French frigate was preparing to sail and desperately trying to buy powder from the Sultan. Well, Wanda agreed to carry a bribe to the Sultan's vizier to stop the powder sale. Stephen and Raffles hid Fox's letter, which discredited Edwards, and Stephen learned from Raffles that his bank was indeed bankrupt. Raffles gave Jack a Dutch 20-gun ship, which Jack named the Nutmeg of Consolation. Mm. Now, this week in Chapter 4, Jack works to complete his crew and to have the Nutmeg ready in time to hopefully intercept the French. Stephen spends time with Raffles at the governor's country residence, and we have a nondescript plant naming, a local civet, a potential coffee connection, reflections on glory, and we ponder Anglican prayer. It's about time somebody did. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) Old shipmates return, new friends leave or are left, and once again, time and tide wait on no man, whether they're standing on principle or not. Yes, this this is a moment when we get to say there's not a moment to lose. Lots of kind of kinks and twists in the story got either you know, appeared or ironed out last week. Mike, let's see where we're headed to this week. More, more twists are we on our way? Stephen hears from Van Buren some intelligence about the movements of this French frigate, the Cornelie. Cornelie is going to sail on the 17th of the month, but our local man Van Buren doesn't know if she was allowed to purchase gunpowder and that obviously is going to make a big difference to the kind of proposition that she offers for jack if they can find a way to meet her out on the ocean the nutmeg meanwhile is in pretty good shape she's dry she has a sweet smelling hold but is far from ready to sail in the matter of rigging and stores and all the rest of it progress is going really slow and mike this is almost a hark back to our first encounter with Jack when he was trying to set up the Sophie at the beginning of Master and Commander. He's got these guilds. This time he hasn't got dockyard mateys in Mahon. He's got dockyard mateys in Batavia. There are Dutch guilds, and they have strict rules, these unions that say they won't allow help from outside parties. And after a little bit of a consultation with Raffles, we discover that actually it turns out, we learn, that Jack has no objection to a bit of dockyard corruption. And Raffles then is able to suggest that maybe his clerk of works could speak with the dockyard superintendent. And Mike, I, I, I love the response from Jack here. This is a, a total Jackism. I suppose, said Raffles, you gentlemen of the Navy are wholly opposed to corruption. Corruption, sir, cried Jack. I love the word. Ever since my very first command, I've corrupted any dockyard or ordnance or victualling board officer who had the shadowiest claim to a traditional present and who could help get my ship to sea a little quicker and in slightly better fighting trim. And that's Jack harking back to Master and Commander. We get to hark back as well, Mike. I remember in our interview with Gord Lacko many, many books ago, he said, for even for modern day seagoing officers this idea of sweetening things with the guys ashore seemed to ring pretty true so jack to the fore with his corruptions and his gold doubloons now speaking of doubloons raffles is really glad to hear that jack is still banking with whores so that he unlike stephen can actually draw on his bank can uh, can can write a note to get uh, get credit here and jack really begins to rue the day that he had told stephen about Smith and Klaus. This is the bank. We now think Stephen's bank, who have declared themselves bankrupt. Right, right. Well, working with Xiao Yan, Jack's money soon has all the guilds working together with the entire Nutmeg crew. And there's so much enthusiasm between all of them working together that the officers actually have to constrain them so they won't hurt themselves. Jack has the Nutmeg painted in, guess what? 
Nelson's checker, of course. Amen. No other paint job for our, for our Royal Navy ship. And the dockyard turns out has basically every supply that anybody on the crew can think of. They have it and they have it in abundance with lots of choices. So, you know, we read how they take particular care picking out everything, especially the 32 pound carronades and the shot for them. Mm. This is all part of Jack's strategy. He wants to engage this French frigate. He's thinking about their superior firepower and size. And he's saying, you know, the only way we're going to have a chance here is to go yard arm to yard arm. And with the nutmeg, if it's got all carronades, this heavy weight of metal, boom, pounder, and then border in the smoke. They could never match her with the French's long guns at a distance here. Now, Jack still has his one brass nine pounder that they salvage, and they've gotten another one like it to use as chasers. But the rest are going to be all carronades here. Jack has really gone overboard in this thing. He's redesigned the ports on the ship. He's redesigned the rigging to accommodate it. We know that carronades are likely to snap back and uh, set the rigging on fire. And in order to deal with their tremendous recoil, he's actually got Chinese carpenters working on a new incline carronade slide design to catch this, you know, catch the impact of this recoil here. Now, Raffles is looking at all this, Jack's explaining it, and Jack makes sure that Stephen's out of earshot when he says, what's the use of being almost rich if you can't dash away on occasion? Oh, good question. What's the point indeed? Chance to indulge some corruption. I I love the fact that we're getting a specific reason now for these 32 pounder carronades. The surprise has got them as ballast in her hold, I think. And We've always kind of seemed to have fought a little bit shy of the idea of completely arming a ship out in carronades, but we'll have to see. We'll have to see how they work out here. Jack, therefore, is spending lots of his time aboard the Nutmeg. He's searching for a carpenter to help him, a purser, and two or three capable midshipmen as well, because Reed and Bennett can't go aloft or stand watch in heavy weather. Stephen, while this is all going on, is spending time ashore with Raffles, either in the Citadel or at his country retreat. Now, Mike, this country retreat, I, I read it on the page and it says Butenzorg to me, but I'm, I think in Dutch we, we can be a bit more correct. What do you think? We could. You know what? I don't I don't think it'll pick up from here. Let me try it just for fun. Botezorg. Botezorg. Yeah, that's that's what I'm hearing. At least it's got to be true because we found it on the internet. But uh, yeah. you know, that, that guttural ending, sure, I would love to be able to do that. <laughs> Yeah, as as with so much of the rest of the Dutch language. To our Dutch listeners, we, we we love hearing you speak, but we have no idea how to take the words off the page and turn them into, into spoken words. This uh, Botazor place, this, this is the actual governor's residence, I think. It was Raffles' residence from 1817 to 1867. And again, not Raffles, but later in history, from 1925 until 1942. So it's a real place. And it was the real residence here. It's about 37 miles south of Batavia, which... Nowadays, we call the city of Jakarta, which is a really, really big city in a really populous country. Stephen's preparing to ride out there. Um, He's trying to decide whether or not to carry a large, heavy, waterproof cloak when he gets approached by Sowerby. Now, Sowerby's been a bit of an odd fella so far. He's the guy who made those very unfortunate remarks about the Papists and the Irish in the previous chapter. He is a bit of a naturalist, though, and he kind of shuffles up to Stephen thanks him, says that the governor had told him, Sowerby, that Stephen's recommendation had got him a job. And initially, Stephen is fine to accept the compliment, but he says, well, really, you don't owe me any thanks. You've got great papers. I looked at all his candidate papers and and, and you were clearly the best. In appreciation, therefore, in this deliciously awkward moment here, Sowerby says, I've named a nondescript plant after you. And he gives Stephen a letter with the details. But Mike, we don't need the letter, really, to find out the important things about what this plant's all about. Well, luckily, Stephen has tucked this letter up above his wig and, and underneath his round hat. Because as Stephen and Ahmed ride on, it starts pouring. And Stephen, who had decided against the cloak, is, is getting wet, except for under that hat there. <laughs> The horses are upset. There are tons of freshwater turtles kind of partly walking, partly swimming across the road. But later, they're too wet and shy to be bothered by this mass crossing of fire-bellied toads. So not so great a weather, but still a naturalist paradise here. 
And, you know, <laughs> Stephen, we find out not only has he got this wig and hat protecting this letter, but it's his one remaining wig, an old, you know, kind of nasty thing, because Stephen won't pay the island's exorbitant prices for another wig. And we'll, we'll stick a pin in that. That'll come back and again here. <laughs> but you were saying we're going to learn a little bit more about this specimen, right? Yeah. So he, he gets a moment here to open the letter and examine the specimen. And Raffle says, I've, I've never seen this plant before. What they do notice is the terrible smell. And they say it resembles a stapelia, which is a succulent plant known as a carrion flower because it smells like rotting flesh and mike we're remembering at this point as well i think that we have durians in this natural environment as well and they're pretty stinky too so and and we get this nice little bit of physical comedy as this plant continues to play a role in the scene that uh, un unravels itself here they move it to the windowsill hopefully to get rid of some of the aroma stephen explains that Sauby had found this stinky plant growing on a parasite on the glabrous bugwort no idea what a glabrous bugwort is, but it doesn't sound beautiful, does it? Um, and thinks that it might be insectivorous. That is to say, it might be an insect-eating plant, like a Venus flytrap. Stephen asks if maybe the gift had satirical intent. And Raffle says, well, this is this is Sowerby. And here he, he explains this kind of slightly awkward side of Sowerby. He says he would never think of it. He's too methodical. He's completely humorless. And by the way, all, all the other methodical and humorless people have tended to become Stephen's friends at some point. Or another, right, when we've right. <laughs> too true. <laughs> and Mrs. Raffles comes in and we get another spin of the wheel with this smelly plant. She says, what's that? There's something died in the room. I'm going to get Abdul to take it to the potting shed. So she says, Stephen, well, it's probably better to have a plant, even this prodigious curious one. Prodigious curious here, I think, is code for a stinky. Better to have that named after you than a disease. And there's probably plenty of diseases in this part of the world that he couldn't have named after him as well. Yeah. So so thank goodness he picked the naturalist side rather than the doctor side for oh, you yeah. there, Stephen. Well, Raffles asked Stephen if Jack needs any additional hands for the ship. He says that he's been looking. He knew Jack needed a purser. He hasn't found one. He's found an excellent clerk for him. And there are two young gentlemen he, he really can't vouch for. He says they may or may not suit for the midshipman's berth. And he says to Stephen, you know, if you'll invite Jack to come dine on Thursday, he can meet them, you know, before, after, during. And then he adds that he's a little bit curious about Jack's plans for the Cornelie. Mm -hmm. And maybe Raffles can kind of bend his authority a little bit and send a sloop with him. There's one, the Kestrel, which is coming in at the end of the week. And Stephen starts to answer him, but he's distracted by an animal at the window. And, you know, he asks Raffles, what's that? And Raffles tells him it's, it's a Tangalung or a Java civet. And Raffles calls it by name, Tabitha. It crawls into his lap and it frowns at Stephen. And I was, I was kind of taken aback. I thought, you know, animals don't frown at Stephen. You know, animals love Stephen. Animals go. And I thought, well, this is, this is an unusual reaction. Is, is this because, Stephen, you didn't know what I was? Or is this civet kind of anticipating Stephen's answer to Raffles' question about the sloop maybe yeah. i don't know but you know it's it's funny i have no idea ian whether pob picked up up on this reference or not that civets are curiously related to coffee in this part of the world right yeah so civets famously have a role to play in producing kopi luwak one of the world's most expensive coffees i don't know if it's exactly the same species of civet or the same variety allegedly this or not allegedly i think we know this that this right. civet eats only the very best coffee beans processes them through their digestive system and then people collect the civet poop with the whole beans intact and besides being just a perverse sounding thing apparently it's real in that there's a protein a bitter tasting protein in coffee that is removed by the natural gastrointestinal fermentation in the civet's gut. So I've heard of this. It's never appealed to me to try civet poop coffee, although I guess at some point in my life, somebody will offer me some. And the connection with civets and coffee must, I don't know, it, sh surely O'Brien must have heard of this. And maybe he's hoping that this will just ring a little bell with us knowing that Jack and Stephen are fans of coffee. It was fascinating as, as we looked into this more, because I used to think this was the most expensive 
brand of coffee. And perhaps at one time it was, but I, I learned that there's now one called Black Ivory, which is actually a multiple of, of the price of this coffee. And it turns out that that coffee is naturally refined by elephants in Thailand, Whoa. fed the coffee beans and processed through their digestive system. So that's a whole lot of coffee, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, it really is. Although yeah, there's probably economies of scale in there somehow. I can't think what they would be. I don't much envy the guys who have to sift through the poop looking for the coffee beans, but let's not imagine that. Let's not imagine that. Oh my gosh. So in answer then to Ruffles' offer of this sloop, the Kestrel, Stephen, knowing Jack's attitude to these things from many, many, many previous such occasions, says, well, I speak with no authority not true. He speaks with great authority, but never mind. I speak with no authority or any consultation with Jack, but I believe that Jack means to take the Cornelie if he can find her. And he says the Kestrel is too small to make a difference to the physical outcome, but he says it would have a disastrous effect on the metaphysical result. If the Cornelie wins, she is covered with laurels for taking two ships, the Nutmeg and the Kestrel. If she loses at two to one odds, she suffers no disgrace and Aubrey wins no glory, since, as Stephen reminds us, the newspapers and public take little notice of the relative strength of opposing ships. And Raffles' ears clearly pick up. Is Aubrey much attached to glory? And by the way, I'm pretty sure Raffles wasn't averse to a bit of glory himself here. Aubrey much attached to glory, he asks. Certainly, says Stephen, he fairly worships Nelson, but I do not think there is any taint of vanity about him, as perhaps there was in his hero. Aubrey's personal triumph, however, is of no importance in this hypothetical encounter. The essential aim, which he recognises with perfect clarity, is to lower French self-esteem, particularly French naval self-esteem. It is, I do assure you, a matter of such importance that I should go to, uh, have been to, surprising lengths. And thankfully, we don't get to hear about the surprising lengths. Stephen doesn't get to finish because dinner is announced. And I love this discussion that's going on here of Stephen and motivation. He's thinking about the tyranny of Bonaparte, the, the idea that together they want to lower French naval esteem. And then he finds himself caught out. I think he might have been about to reveal too much about his role as an intelligence agent. And even for a trusted person like Raffles, there are some things that I think Stephen doesn't want to disclose. Loose lips and all that. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, right. Well, Stephen heads back to the ship and, and he gets on board. And he says, heavens, Mr. Richardson, my dear, what a hullabaloo. What are all these people about? Ah, good morning, sir, says Richardson. They're rattling down the shrouds. Oh, well, God be between them and evil, says Stephen. It looks horribly <laughs> dangerous to me. <laughs> and so I, I love that. And I love Stephen's reaction. And then this line is just classic. Would himself be in the ship? <laughs> and meaning, of course, the captain. Yeah, Would yeah. himself be in the ship? And, and in fact, Jack is in the ship. He's having coffee. And O'Brien doesn't tell us whether this is a civet assisted coffee or not. But He's been up since pre-dawn. It's been a really busy morning. And Steve is commenting on how he just can't believe how much they've accomplished in three days. And he loves this new cabin. He says it looks pretty much the same as the one they had on the surprise, but with much more room because of the carronades rather than long guns taking up a part of it. Yeah, there we go. The payoff for carronades at last. Yeah, <laughs> fewer men and more space around them. And of course, I mean, we've had this really nice explanation earlier on about how it suits the, the tactics for how he wants to set about the corner lead as well. Good. Yay for carronades. I'm, I'm back on team carronade now. It's good. Right. Stephen tells Jack about this invitation to dine with Raffles on Thursday. And in a very typical Jack moment, I can almost see Jack's face falling like, what, Thursday? And he goes on and says, to be honest, I was hoping to sail tomorrow. He's got this plan for completing his stores and then the evening tide. He doesn't want to lose a couple of days with shore-based civilities, but he does want to be polite to Raffles, who's helped them so much and got, got him on the track of all this beneficent corruption here. He says, we can shorten this a little bit. I don't have to meet the clerk and the potential midshipman at dinner, so can you get Raffles to give them a note to come and see me on the ship? So this is great. Jack, so short-circuiting some of the... Uh, 
the niceties here. He asks Stephen then to give a little account of why these midshipmen had been discharged. And I think I detect a bit of relish in Stephen giving such a, such an account of these two midshipmen. He says, ah, drunkenness, fornication and sloth were their undoing. He says they weren't discharged. They were abandoned because they didn't get to the docks from their disorderly house until noon. And the squadron had sailed at dawn. So these midshipmen, it seems, have been living in squalor ashore ever since, waiting for the Indiaman to return. And Jack says, well, I, I can do without a purser. The old purser's steward and Jack in the dust are quite good, but I do need a clerk. He doesn't want to lose all his records, all his hydrography, all of his temperature and salinity recordings for Humboldt. He also doesn't want to suffer the fate of a certain Captain Mackintosh, who had lost half of his papers in the battle, dropped the other half over the side, wrapped in lead, and written a nasty note, a, a not entirely family-friendly note, right. to the Admiralty, to the sick and hurt board. A Greek sponge diver, it turned out, had found them and brought them to the flagship for a reward for all to see. And uh, Stephen honours this little uh, anecdote with an Aubreyism of his own. He says, ah, so he'd counted his chickens without reckoning with his host. And uh, we, we, we've, we've got to hope that maybe that's a gentle tease for Jack. What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I figured it has to be because, I mean, these are the kinds of things that Jack says all the time. Yeah. I can't remember Stephen saying anything like this. And when Jack says it, you know, not only does he mangle them, but sometimes they just don't make much sense. And I'm looking back at this one going, well, wait a minute. So, you know, counting your chickens before your their hatch, counting on something that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not really it. Reckoning without one's host is is the other piece of it. And that comes from an old idiom about, for example, calculating your lodging bill without checking into your with your innkeeper first. So, you know, you don't know about it. So, yeah. you know, you, you don't want to leave out an important person uh, or set of facts from coming to a conclusion here. And, and neither of these seem to apply <laughs> with this, this thing about <laughs> dropping the records over the thing. But it's hilarious and it's great and it's an Aubreyism. So we'll take it here. You know, we were talking a week or so ago about uh, hubris, the Greek concept. And, and here, I think, right, Jack really doesn't want to anger the Admiralty gods like uh, like Macintosh has. <laughs> Jack's been thinking about promoting Conway in the foretop and, you know, bringing him up to the midshipman's berth. But he knows that it's really hard to give orders to men who were just your messmates the day before and to join a berth of people who the day before were your superiors. So he's he's kind of thinking, that's what I'd really like to do. I know we need more midshipmen. And then he's, you know, he's talking this through with Stephen. And he says he's also worried that, you know, his promotions have often been very unlucky. And, you know, this would be a promotion perhaps to the quarter deck, and that's a very unhealthy place in action. And yeah. Stephen's kind of surprised. He says, well, you know, midshipmen, aren't they usually with their gun crews or in the tops with the small arms men during an action? And Jack says, yeah, they, you know, they usually are, but some of them are always serving kind of like aides de camp to the captain and the first lieutenant. So they're going to be right there on the quarter deck. And I, I, I had to honestly admit I was a little bit like, oh, no. Oh, <laughs> oh no. I know. I know. Patrick O'Brien isn't just writing this for fun's sake to throw it in here. Maybe to throw us off a little bit. But I got a little worried about these three. I, I'm wondering, uh, okay, who's going to survive here? Right. Yeah. And it, it's a little reminder as well that like we've often been on the quarter deck with Jack in action, but Stephen hasn't. It's a nice reminder that he normally his station is down below tending to the wounded and like you say mike there's some there's some jeopardy by the sound of it here let's see on wednesday they do finally move the nutmeg out and also manage to get far enough away from her to judge her trim she's a little by the stern and fortunately says mr warren i've, I've laid it laid hoses between the different tiers of water barrels so i can pump water forward so that we won't have to redo all of the ballasting and stowing of the hold very smart bit of bosunry there by mr warren Stephen and Welby are about to take a boat back to the nutmeg when a running, panting youth asks them to wait and give him and his friend, who is much further back because his heel has come off his shoe, uh, to give them a ride. And it, it's a very charmingly sort of low-key chaotic introduction to these two midshipmen here. Stephen looks at them. They're thin. They're underfed. They've tried to gussy themselves up a little bit, but they're shabby. They've outgrown their clothes. They have barely presentable clothes and they've 
been trying to shave, so they've got cuts all over their pimply faces, and it, it, it's all really not adding up to a very flattering picture here. They're pitiful. And I, I like this, the slightly kind of parental point of view that Stephen's got here, remembering again that he's contemplating the arrival of his daughter into the world. And I think usually Stephen's a bit impatient with midshipmen, but now he's willing to be a bit paternalistic and have pity on these poor two wretches here. He does find them uninteresting until one of them in particular responds to Stephen's piercing gaze by saying, I'm afraid we must seem rather squalid, sir. He said it shyly, but with a direct look and an evident confidence in Stephen's goodwill that touched him. Not at all, not at all, said Stephen, but he wonders what Jack will make of them and hopes they are seamen. On board, Fielding tells Stephen that the captain, the, the himself that we've heard about, right. the captain is in the cabin with a surprise. It's funny. I think when I read this line, I was like, with the surprise. No, no, yeah. no. A surprise. Right. Exactly. exactly. Right. And, and it is. Jack, turns out, is with Mr. Adams, who, it turns out, was Jack's clerk and secretary when he was the temporary captain of the Lively. Now, if we go back to that book, we never actually hear Adams mentioned by name, I don't think, but O'Brien has brought him back. And Stephen, it says, is quite happy to see his old shipmate. Jack has complete confidence that Adams can sort out all of the Diane's accounts. And Stephen says he has every confidence in his thermaturgical powers. <laughs> I'm getting a nod from my good friend. <laughs> As I wrestled that one, I was I was looking at that going, what is that? And this is the powers of a magician or a miracle worker. So that now there's a great thing to drop into conversation here. Yeah. I, I, I meant to do the, the Google Ingram on that one, and I did not. Well, there's a crossover for you and all the other joint POB and JK Rowling fans out there, Mike. It turns out that when you look at Google Ingram for the word thaumaturgical, it's it's almost nowhere in 1800. And for some reason, it's got a massive peak from about 2001 onwards. So, you know, who knew? <laughs> Fascinating. Fascinating. I love that. Well, Ryan tells us that Adams is known for his abilities across the Mediterranean, that he's helped many a troubled purser who would come to him in secret. And he's also been the source behind some written captain's dispatches that were just really excellently received. So... It, we, we find out that Adams at one time thought about becoming a purser, but didn't like all the candle counting. So he can do that job. And he doesn't like to miss out on the cutting out expedition. So yeah. this idea of, of the clerk and the secretary that also can kind of fill the role of purser. Perfect choice for Jack. Perfect choice for the nutmeg. Hey, man. So we, we still have these two midshipmen here and we have to get Jack's appraisal of them. He meets with them despite this slightly shabby charm that they appear to have, at least in Stephen's eyes, Jack is still not impressed. And he learns that they have an undistinguished service history and only moderate natural abilities. He says, I don't know your captains. You've got no recommendations. You're technically deserters. But if you wish, I'll enter you on the books as able seamen. And if that doesn't suit, you can go ashore on the next boat. And I think there's a, there's a bit of a collective gulp and a grimace from these two, but they say, well, okay, so we'll stay. He says, the nutmeg has got good men on the lower deck if you do your duty. And if you don't top it the knob, he, I love this phrase, if, above all, he says, if you don't top it the knob, then you'll really get to understand the service through and through. Many a good man, he says, meaning I, me, myself, many a good man started his career there or was turned before the mast. And now he's expressing hope on his own behalf only to hoist his flag later. And Jack reminds him that he himself had served there as a midshipman. And they're too well ingrained in service culture to try and debate this or argue with Jack, but I think we get enough of their reaction to know that they're not overwhelmed with joy at the prospect of, uh, of shipping before the mast, but that's what's going to happen. Uh, Jack asks Fielding to enter Oaks and Miller on the ship's books, rated able, with the starboard watch and stationed in the foretop. And it turns out that there was some particular purpose there, as we'll hear a bit later on. Oakes and Miller managed to conceal their distress <laughs> under a decent appearance of gratitude. And Mike, we've got this parallel to Jack's early career that we've heard about several times now. And 
I, I've got to wonder what is it in these two hapless youths that makes Jack think that, ah, maybe I see a little bit of myself there. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking exactly the same thing, uh, that uh, this is Jack seeing himself. And it's it's that continuing thing that we've seen of Jack more and more interested in the midshipmen and their well-being. Yeah. Well, it makes me feel all warm and glowing <laughs> thinking about Jack <laughs> and, and, and thinking about these young guys. Maybe we take a short break contemplate where we go here now that we're getting our crew together on the nutmeg. Very good. We'll be right back. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back from the break. I hope you're all doing well. On Thursday, we learn that Ahmed comes into Stephen's cabin. And very unexpectedly, this guy that we've had with us for, what, a book, a book and a half now, kneels, touches his head to the floor, and begs to depart. And Mike, Mike, this is a really strong visual image for me. This very nice, softly spoken, but very resourceful guy, really prostrating himself before Stephen. He says he wants to be with his family and can't bear the idea of heading off for what he calls an unknown world, a worse England. And he gives Stephen parting gift. He presents him with a special box for his coca leaves, because what all Stephen's best friends do is give him drug paraphernalia. right? And also a wig, one that he says is a poor thing, but it's the best the island can produce. And we remember earlier on that Stephen had declined to buy one for himself because they were so expensive. And Stephen... In sharp contrast to me, I've got to say, uh, Stephen had expected this and he very graciously gives Ahmed leave to go, gives him a small purse of these coins, these Johannes, and uh, a handsome written testimonial in case Ahmed wishes to be employed again. And the uh, the new wig we discover adorns Stephen as he heads freshly powdered over to the dinner with Governor Raffles. Mrs. Raffles, this somehow sets me up with anticipation here for some comedy or some drama somehow. Mrs. Raffles has invited four Dutch ladies with moderately fluent English, delicate complexions, and undiminished bulk and merriment <laughs> as company for Jack and Stephen. And this is this is the kind of thing that might have troubled Jack in the past, but it's going to trouble Stephen. He's taken in by the, the low necklines and what O'Brien calls that nacreous Reuben's flesh that had so puzzled him before. The nacreous flesh did in fact exist, and it excited desire. The notion of being in bed with one of these cheerful, exuberant creatures quite troubled him for a moment, and he regretted Mrs. Raffles' signal at which they all departed while the men gathered at the end of the table. And Mike, it, it seems that kicking the opium habit is having quite the effect on Stephen here. Ah, uh, it's too bad he's a world away from Diana. Otherwise, there'd be yet more generations of uh, of baby maturins coming. <laughs> and there's an interesting usage here of this word and this this reference and connection to color, right? Well, it is. O'Brien just throws these things in, but I, I was sort of d- jumping back in. I was like, necreous and you know what's going on here? And sure enough, Rubens kind of changed the way that flesh color was used in classical paintings to include blues among these necreous or mother of pearl iridescent colors. And and it has both a a, a literal physical difference as well as a symbolic abstract difference in meaning. So nicely done, Mr. O'Brien, once again here. Yeah, it's a signature word for POB as well, almost as good as prating. Too true. Exactly right. Yeah. Well, Raffles, while he's got them both together, you know, he says, you know, he's already asked Stephen and as a political man. Now he wants to ask Jack as a fighting captain about having the Kestrel sail with him, this sloop that we talked about earlier. And and Jack's concerned that, for example, if the Cornelie saw two ships hauled down in poor light, might just flee and they'd never have a chance to engage. That even though they're smaller, if they're far off and, you know, ship rig like that. And he also says, you know, and and She's not coming in until the end of the week, and then she's going to have to refit and take on stores and water. If we delay, we might miss the opportunity to engage the French entirely. And he says, I, and I have to agree with Stephen on the political, or as Jack says, the political or spiritual side, 
the mm. more the French Navy can be persuaded that they're always to be beat, the less likely they are ever to win. And so, boy, you know, Jack and Stephen have both underscored this really well, this kind of advantage uh, psyching out that opponent there. And it's a long-term thing. He's, he's after the victory, not just for now, but for degrading French morale for, for months and years to come. Well, yeah. And as one of the relative newcomers over here in this, <laughs> this, this not long-lived part of the world, you know, when I look back on these centuries and centuries <laughs> of warfare at the time, <laughs> I get that. I can see where you'd want that because you're living right next door to everybody. Oh, it's it's amazing that you guys have put up with those bloody Canadians for so long, Mike. Oh my gosh, they're so <laughs> wonderful. Like, you know, it, what what in the world is nicer than a Canadian? I just uh, uh, yeah yeah makes makes me wish my draft number had come up uh, lower. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so Jack says that. In fact, with Raffles' permission, and I'll say it as, as O'Brien wrote it, slip my moorings within five minutes of taking leave of Mrs. Raffles, and once I've sunk the land to stand eastwards under all the sail she can carry. And so Raffles, Raffles is now picking up on this spirit. He says, my dear, said the governor, we must not keep Captain Aubrey for more than the ritual cup of coffee. He's fairly pawing the ground. He is all eagerness to stand eastwards and persuade the French that they are always to be beat. So we, we have certainly got this theme going here. Oh, great stuff. Well, Mrs. Ruffles isn't going to completely give in to this martial hurry. She's curious then about what's going to happen with the two young boys. And Jack breaks the news to her that he's taken them as common sailors not as midshipmen, and she's quite aghast at this. But she says that these are gentlemen's sons. Yeah, these are genteel folks. And Jack says, well, I was too when I was turned before the mast and that it was rough and hard. And he says, I wept like a girl when no one could see me, but it had been really good for him. The common sailor, as Jack explains, on the whole is a very decent sort of man. And Jack says, and, and now his long game comes out here, I'm going to try these boys on the lower deck for a few weeks. And then if I'm right about them, I'll bring them on with another hand, somebody else that he has in mind for promotion. And he, he explains his scheme here that this Fortman that he plans to promote would come after with them, feeling neither lost nor a stranger in the midshipman's berth. I have seen to it that they are in the same watch and they are messmates. So brilliant piece of leadership here by Jack. Starboard watch, four topman. Jack has planted these two young midshipmen along with the four topman that he wants to bring, as they say, aft through the horse hole. And they can all help each other out. It's a really, really nice piece of social engineering, very inspired leadership. I, I just love that. This is all sounding great, but we, we've got more conversation still to get through at this dinner table here. One of the Dutch ladies asks if it would be indiscreet to ask him why Jack was turned before the mast. Well, ma'am said Jack with an engaging leer. It was partly because of my devotion to the sex, but even more because I stole the captain's tripe. Sex? cried the Dutch ladies. Tripe? they whispered amongst themselves, blushed, looked very grave, and fell silent. <laughs> and I love the idea that these uh, these otherwise rather sexually appealing women are, are, are shocked by the idea of sex and tripe in the same sentence. Right. Only a Brian could make that line as funny as it is <laughs> too too true oh well jack and stephen return to the ship and, and just like jack promised it slips its moorings and you know we had the sound of the small ship's band playing uh people are watching on shore as the young women are waving their handkerchiefs goodbye until they're out of sight and they're headed for this cape Krawang. they remain there on Friday, so it's Thursday night, they're still there Friday, uh, they're still there Saturday, they're still there Sunday. And it turns out that that wind that Jack had been loving all week had stopped and is now working against them. And that the water is running westward at the same pace or greater than every eastward at a speed they can pick up. Uh, Jack tries everything. He's trying to anchor with cables during the flood and then try to take advantage of the ebb. He tries to go far out among the thousand islands to look for more favorable winds. He tries sweeping. He tries pulling with boats. And I, you know, Ian, I was amazed by this. And I, 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 
I thought I got, I got to drop in on Tom Horn's cannonade.net and find out, right. you know, what this looks like. And, and Tom, as always, thank you, does a great job of showing us, you know, how he's, you know, he's trying to kind of get up and if you, if you will, as I'm looking at the screen, go right. And he keeps getting you know, taken left here and can't get around yeah. that way. You're my sailor here. I, I can't say that I know anything about this phenomenon in these waters, but any place where you've got land masses that are tight together, you'll get these really fast tidal flows. So anybody that's so – Northwestern Europe is one of the places in the world where this happens the most, so we're used here to oh, quite yeah. strong tidal flows. So the fact that you can just get stuck behind what they call the tidal gate doesn't happen very much in the Caribbean, doesn't happen very much in the Mediterranean. By the time you get out to where we are here in the South China Sea, this thing happens again, these really strong tidal flows and <laughs> – it's called stemming the tide. You've just got to kind of sit there and hope that the ground that you make with your ship at some point manages to out outmatch the rate at which the water that you're sailing on is taking you back in the wrong direction. And wow. it can be really, really frustrating. In all of this, then, Jack learns a great deal, not only about the tidal waters around where he is, but about sailing the nutmeg. We learn that she's not uh, brisk or lively with the wind much abaft the beam, but on a bowling, that is to say, sailing into the wind, sailing close hauled, she's fast and weatherly. And just those two trigger words might make us think, really? Like the surprise? And O'Brien answers that straight away in the next phrase here. Not quite as fast as the surprise, but without the surprise's tendency to gripe and steer wild. And it's funny, the surprise was personified as a character really early on in her appearance in the canon. And just by being compared with the surprise, I think Nutmeg of Consolation gets a little bit of personification. She gets a character of her own, which is really, really nice. They learn then that the Nutmeg has her best trim, and it turns out to be a half straight by the stern. So their, their trim conversation has worked out here. It turns out though that that was what they'd started with. <laughs> with, with the best sails and the best trim, they still can't sail against both wind and tide, which is the, the eternal truth behind the mariner in tidal waters here, I think. On Sunday, then, Jack gets to condemn the idea of acting on principle. He, re he recounts a, uh, an anecdote where he said, it's always ended unhappy for me, like telling his girl upon his word and honour that she was prettier than the other girl. And by the way, Mike, any kind of conversation like this with your beloved explaining her relative prettiness next to somebody else, that's not a place for objective honesty. <laughs> he stayed until Thursday for the governor's dinner on principle and lost his perfect wind. He says he doesn't blame Stephen for this, but Stephen will never understand that, as we both know, Mike, tide and time wait for no man. In the face of this, Stephen's got the perfect reply, which is to completely avoid it. He blanks it and says, is there any more marmalade? <laughs> Jack says he's worried. He doesn't mind going against principle, but he's more careful when it comes to going against religion. And he advances a very tentative conversational gambit here. He asks whether it would be improper to pray for a fair wind. And given all the accidental flings that have gone against Stephen about papism and superstition and popery, he's on very, very thin ice here. And Stephen ad advances a bit of theological uh, knowledge here. He says, it is certainly allowable to pray for rain. And I know that it is quite often done, but as to wind, might that not have a most offensive resemblance to your present heathen practices? Might it not look like a mere reinforcement of your scratching backstays and whistling till you are black in the face? Or even, here it comes, even, God forbid, to popery, Martin would tell us the Anglican usage. <laughs> I think like, Stephen's absolutely laying it on a bit thick here. He knows he's got Jack at a disadvantage and he's just going to gently twist the uh, the conversational knife here. He says... I'll, I'll beg for the intercession of a patron or an appropriate saint in my private devotions, but suggests that even without Martin, Jack would be maybe safe in informing, if not in uttering, a vehement wish for better weather. And this is very, very tentative, very, very half-hearted, this idea of invoking you know, God's help in generating wind. And Jack can tell that this isn't, this isn't quite the whole thing here. He says, I, I wish that Martin was there or better, that they were there, meaning there with the surprise. Yeah, and being married to a theologian, I, <laughs> I love these <laughs> discussions. And it, it is amazing how <laughs> some of them are, are about like this one. Well, rain, yes, wind, I don't know. Others yeah. really, you know, kind of 
you see the whole world in a different way. But O'Brien gives us not only this little kind of niggle because the way Stephen's putting Jack on, but he takes us behind the wall here where Killick and his new mate, William Grimshaw, who, who is, by the way, an old shipmate of Killick and Jack's and had just rejoined the ship here, they're listening in. And Grimshaw asks who this Martin is. And, and you know, there's this wonderful long section you should read with Killick filling him in on Martin's backstory <laughs> with his unique blend of Killick humor and all the gossip about Martin. And he says, but, you know, he ends it with saying now Martin is the surgeon on the surprise, which is headed west around the world to meet them, meet them on the nutmeg and that they have been in the Diane and the nutmeg headed east around the world. And Grimsall says, well, you know, what poor unfortunate buggers on the surprise and Killick's kind of, well, why, why do you say that? He says, well, you know, they've been sailing westward. And when you sail westward into the date change line, you lose a day and that's a day's pay. And O'Brien writes, <laughs> Killick pondered, looking shrewish, discontented, suspicious. And then his face lightened and he cried, but we've been sailing steady eastwards. So if we cross up a Monday... Tomorrow is Wednesday, and we have Tuesday's pay for nothing. Ha, 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 ain't that right, mate? Right as dried peas, mate, <laughs> says Grimshaw. <laughs> and Killing says, God love you, William Grimshaw. <laughs> God, uh, Grimshaw's great. By the way, I think he's been retconned into the, uh, into the story here. But... These funny little gnomic conversations that uh, Killick has with Grimshaw. Let's keep an eye out. In the next chapter, Mike, having said, God love you, William Grimshaw, we're going to have a same but different salute to William Grimshaw to stick a button on another one of these conversations. Ah, excellent. Th this happy news about the date change and the extra day's pay spreads around the ship. And, and by the way, it's a, it's a completely inconsequential piece of news, really, isn't it? A completely abstract thing, but... Sounds like a real extra day's pay for really no extra work. This happy news spreads around the ship, and therefore Jack notices a crew that are happy, less somber when they're together at church. At the end of the service, Jack adds, here he is advancing his very tentative bit of theology, those that see fit may form an humble, earnest wish, although not a presumptuous request, for a fair wind. And... The, the response from those men who can't wait to get to the dateline for their free day's wages is, is too much. He thinks this is too much enthusiastic murmuring here, and this displeases Jack. He'd hoped for moderation because he's very well aware of the dangers of tempting fate. And then the reward comes straight away. When truly shocking weather sets in for the next few days, the other crew members blame this less than humble, this indeed presumptuous request. And uh, we, we all learn the true cost of invoking these kind of things carelessly, right, Mike? Right, that's right. Well, now Jack, he'd learned how the nutmeg responded in the calms and against wind and tide, and now he learns how she responds to all kinds of gales while watching for uncharted rocks and laying to. And, and she does great, laying to as neat and dry as a duck. And Ian, I think that rang a bell for, for you and me. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Um, yeah. And, you know, even in heavy weather, she still comes up within six points of the wind and makes very little leeway, which is really handy you know, when you're all the time finding you're having to put your helm hard over and claw off unexpected islands. Well, the gales are blowing in their preferred direction, and they're constantly having to change sails to accommodate, you know, the strength of the wind and the gale. But with all these unnatural squalls, they end up not being able to make much use of the wind at all because of these dangerous and unknown waters. So now it's almost like, you know, now it's pushing us the way we want to go, but we can't go too fast. So we're having a tough time. And Ian, you, you reminded me the duck analogy. We've heard this before, right? Yeah. And, and maybe I wouldn't have spotted it if we hadn't recently done Master and Commander sort of out of sequence. There's an early reference to the Sophie in one of the early bouts of heavy weather in Master and Commander bobbing along on the surface of the stormy seas and, and the quote is as snug and unconcerned as an eider duck so this is obviously a nice little naturalist's image that o'brien has enjoyed coming back to here you know the idea of a cute little duck round impervious waterproof kind of bobbing along on the surface it's a nice image to add to this personification of the nutmeg that we're getting here well 
when they reach the equator on Friday, and, and by the way, Mike, there's there's no crossing the line ceremony referred to here. So I don't know if that's that we, we've only done it once this voyage and then it's done, or I don't know what the significance is. But anyhow, I wondered exactly the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Thought the same thing. Wait a minute, we always have this crossing the line thing. Didn't hear about it this time. Anyhow, they reach the equator. The monsoon returns back to what they would normally expect, and they get. Um, some relief. They can send up their top gallant masts again and dry their sails, and they're gliding smoothly along at four knots, and they practice their carronade fire. And a little bit like the practices that they earlier had in the calm, as the practice goes well, it would only be better if they had more midshipmen. And therefore, this is the moment that Jack says to Fielding, I'm thinking of promoting Conway, Oakes, and Miller, the four topmen and the two midshipmen. And this like we said before, my great bit of Aubrey leadership fielding, by the way, by the way, we have a, a biddable first lieutenant, which doesn't always happen. Fielding says, absolutely agree. Can't think of anyone better or more deserving. Nice. On Sunday, they, they beat the divisions and Jack and fielding go around and inspect the ship. And, and O'Brien takes time to kind of reacquaint us with who's who on the ship here a little bit. You know, we've got the Marines under Welby, the Afterguard, and the Wasters under Mr. Warren, the Master, and Bennett. The Gunners under Mr. White, because there currently is no quarterdeck officer to, you know, to kind of serve in there. But White also has Fleming. And then they have the four topmen under Richardson and Reed. Now, these include the most agile and highly decorated men on the ship, including the three folks we just talked about, Conway, Oaks, and Miller. So we're coming back to them in a minute. They do, as they go around, Jack notices that the two young men are looking like they're doing a, a lot better, a little less cadaverous, fewer pimples. <laughs> uh, and then they move on to inspect the, the Folkselmen. And these are older, experienced hands under Seymour. And finally, they come to the sick berth with Stephen McMillan and, we learn, a new Loblolly boy. So, you know, it's kind of a quick, okay, you know, we're off on the nutmeg. Here's who's who. Yeah. But then we go back. To, uh, to Jack and his plans for the afternoon. Yeah. So Jack has to get permission to do this because this all comes up at dinner. Uh, by, by the way, Mike, this, again, we're having uh, two dinners in this chapter. I think this is a good sign that we're in healthy, good O'Brien territory here. They're back on the quarter deck as Jack has read the Articles of War and contemplated dinner, which is a harder task now for Richardson and Seymour, who are going to be guests. They've been dining much earlier in the gun room and the midshipmen's mess. They have an excellent meal, and Jack's really glad that the crew is feeling good about the extra day's pay. He's surprised that nobody else had seemed to know about it, and he hopes it will add to what he wants to do in the afternoon. They finish the dinner, they drink the loyal toast, and as Jack speaks of service matters, he tells the whole gun room here about his plan to promote these three young men that day. And he asks... Seymour to help get them settled in in the midshipman's berth. And again, Mike, this, this might have been a difficult moment, but with this, there's this lovely, easy transition. Seymour says, I'm happy to help. We've got clothes that have been bought before that the men can wear. Richardson says that the three of them w will help the working of the ship. So this sounds like a really, really great payoff. Up on deck, they're singing. They're singing in the midshipman's berth that suggests that the evening is going well and the new youngsters are settling in. We learn that they are sewing their new uniforms to fit. And to cap this all, Stephen turns to Jack and says, would you like to play some music? And we're all feeling happy and bubbling along and the midshipman's berth is great and the gun room is great. But Jack says, I don't want to touch anything at the moment because whatever I play will turn into a dirge. He's worried, it turns out, that his plan to intercept the Cornelie won't work given the weather that they've incurred. If he'd known about the weather, he could have intercepted her earlier at a different point. And as it is now, he's going to be chasing her. He's going to be permanently behind, trying to catch up. His plan of attack did not include a stern chase. And this is all wrong, given the differences in the weaponry. Remember, he he'd outfitted the ship with two chasers and then a bunch of short-range 32-pound carronades. This is not the encounter that Jack has planned for. Well, Stephen is saying, you know, well, if the French are going to be in front of us, aren't they going to run into Tom Poolings? And, and Jack says, well, you know, I think that's unlikely given, one, we don't even know where Tom is. Two, the French, you know, if Tom's at the rendezvous point, the French are likely to be sailing on the opposite side of that bay. So unless they 
for some reason, decided to sail closer to where Tom's going to be docked. Tom is going to see him. He says, third, Tom's not going to be looking for Frenchmen in these waters. And he says, finally, even if Tom did see them, he's not going to go chasing off after the French for hundreds of miles and miss the rendezvous. So Jack's saying pretty much, I, I can't even imagine three out of these four things coming right. Four out of four, pretty much impossible here. And he says the, the only thing for it is to crack on like smoke and oakum and hope they can make up some time. But Stephen has a different idea. He starts to question Jack a little bit about, wait a minute. Stephen says, when you speak of a surprise attack and boarding in the smoke, are you not forgetting the possibility of her having no powder? So he's thinking, you know, wait, Jack, you know, we might just be fine here. Yeah. And Jack says, I had not forgotten it very coldly. No, I had certainly not forgotten it, though taking a ship in those circumstances would be about as credible as, well, of, to, to be sure, the possibility exists. But I, could, I cannot base any plan of attack upon it. The only thing that is clear is that I must try to come up with him and then act accordingly, act in a seaman-like manner, he added. And then Jack starts smiling affectionately because he knows his tone has been very wounding. He's clearly very much on edge, and he knows that Stephen's aware of that. So Jack just wants to crack on. He doesn't want to deal with this unfair, but you know, dishonorable, perhaps, confrontation. Uh, he just wants to keep going. Yeah. So the morning watch found that this cracking on is in progress. And uh, let's see what the, the text says to, about this here. With all hands on deck after breakfast, it was carried farther. Royal masts were sent up and their sails were set upon them. Very fine and delicate canvas too. And since the wind, a good steady top gallant breeze was now abaft the beam, studding sails too made their charming appearance. Four on the weather side of the foremast and two on the main with a crowd of staysails, spritsail, spritsail, topsail, of course, with all the jibs that would stand a noble array. Presently, sky sails flashed out above the royals, and all hands watched the water rise high at the bows, sink to the copper abaft the forechains, and then race, hissing along her side, leaving a broad wake behind, stretching straight and true to the west by south. End of chapter four. But, I mean, d despite Jack's foreboding about the, the hopelessness of the chase, it's a beautiful ending to the chapter. This very poetic, yeah, we're back sailing again. We've got all the sails set. The weather's beautiful. We're heading for our rendezvous. Right. You know, we remember all those times bringing Stephen up on deck and saying, you know, ain't you amazed? Look up there. You know, we got the whole shooting match. Here it is. There it is. Beautiful skies, beautiful weather, sailing right along, cracking <laughs> on. Ah. You know, it's it's an interesting chapter. You know, it's it's so true to life to me, and that that you know, in fact, the matter they've got long distances to cover. You know, the timing of the whole thing is is all up to the tides and to the winds. And like life, our best plans sometimes get reduced to hopes and wishes and prayers. Yeah. You know, and 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 humble wishes here. Yeah, fascinated me that there's you know. This seems to be one of those things where you're kind of setting up the chessboard or moving the pieces around before we have the next big round here. And I, and I got a little bit of that feeling, but I also thought back and thought, well, but he's also, you know, O'Brien's continuing to paint this incredibly detailed world and he's painting it absolutely true to the time and place and people here. And yet with so many of the same reflections that we can kind of think back on here in our lives and, and how that mirrors in here. So you know, I, I, I couldn't help but notice today, you know, people issues and how you promote and, and do things. Sometimes uh, how things are spun in the news, how things are understood by the public, how our moods affect our thinking and interacting. You know, we've had a lot about luck and principle and ideas of honor and faith and... You know, I'd start to say religiosity, some of those mm. beliefs and conventions that develop kind of outside of faith, but become associated with it, almost to the point of superstition, if we might yeah. say, you know, all on display in these simple tales of the chapter here. So yeah. I you know, really enjoyed it.
It is great, isn't it? And and some great tidbits there for us to look forward to. How are the new three new midshipmen going to get along? Right. We need to find out at some point how we can resolve the situation with Stephen and his bank. Somewhere out there on the ocean is Pulling's and the surprise yourself. And I, I still don't know as I'm kind of turning the pages here. In my, in my reader's brain, I don't know whether she's going to be on the next page as we turn or whether she's still many chapters under the whole book away. N- never mind where's South America and the, the original mission for the surprise. It's really, really fascinating. We've got the French frigate out there as well, the Cornelie. Maybe that's just going to be dropped or maybe we're going to encounter the Cornelie. Who knows? Um, it seems like O'Brien's still got plenty in store for us. And Mike, we're still only early in this book here. Yeah, I, I guess there's only one thing for it. What do you say next week, Ian, to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Mike, I should like that of all things. <laughs> Dutch 20-gun ship, which Jack named the Nutmeg of Consolidation, hence our book title. No, he didn't. <laughs> oh, my God. Why do I say that every time? Okay, Sam. <laughs> there's your I'll take. Then, yeah. <laughs> Jack gave... <laughs> Jeez. Okay, let's try that again. Would you, would you like to consolidate all your loans into one easy payment? You could I do, that. do. I don't know why in the world it's like cavalry and cavalry. It's just always <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Here we go.